Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, this afternoon, um, we're going to be having a discussion of NATO's role in great power rivalries. Uh, this discussion will be led by our Robert strauss soupe chair in geopolitics, Robert D. Kaplan, and he's going to be discussing this topic with General Philip Breedlove. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of our Robert Strauss Who Paid project, and it's also uh, part of a podcast that's going to be released this summer. This is one of the episodes, so please stay tuned for the release of that podcast. I'd also like to mention, if you're a fan of uh, Robert D. Kaplan, uh, he's also going to be teaching a seminar this fall on um, great geopolitical thinkers of the 20th century. It's going to be an eight-part seminar. And again, that's coming this fall. The exact dates are yet to be scheduled, but please stay tuned. Um, I'd also like to mention a couple of upcoming events, uh, which include tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have a discussion at uh, three to four o'clock on whether the G7 in the time of COVID. Um, that's also part of the Robert Strauss Who Pay project. And Ron Granieri will be joined by Georgetown University's Amitai Etzioni and the Scowcroft Center for Sec Strategy and Security's Ash Jane for that discussion. On Thursday afternoon, we'll have what has become a tradition. It's the Ginsburg Sattel Lecture by Walter McDougall. And this year he'll be talking about the amazing career of Steven Gerrard, the Philadelphia tycoon and philanthropist. That's Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. So, so please stay tuned. Um, a reminder uh, before I turn it over to Bob Kaplan, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be taking uh, your questions roughly halfway through the program. Um, so before I turn it over to Bob, I'd also like to say a special thank you to our members, our sponsors, our donors. And if you're not yet in one of those categories, please, considering, please consider becoming part of those categories. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Robert Kaplan. Well, thank you, Raleigh. Uh, welcome everyone to another in the series of great power rivalries in the age of global demons. Um, and with us today is General Philip Breedloff, former SACUR strategic uh, Supreme Allied Commander of, uh, of, of, of Europe and, and NATO, uh, an, an Air Force General, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome him here. It's an honor. And so let me just jump right into it with the first question, because we will have a lot of ground to cover. General Breedloff, um, the, the Cold War, NATO was created in 1949, and the Cold War ended exactly 40 years later in 1989, for all practical purposes. Um, and at the time, every, there were a lot of voices saying NATO has no future role. What will NATO do now? Wither NATO? But that was 32 years ago. NATO has actually existed in a post-Cold War framework for almost a third of a century. If we were together, if we, if we got together in a few years, we'd actually be able to say that the Cold War was only the first half of NATO's existence. Um, so obviously, despite all the criticisms, NATO must be doing something right to stay relevant. It can, it, you know, and it might be a bit of bureaucratic inertia, but that would only be a part of it. So why don't you take us into, into how NATO has evolved uh, you know, in the Cold War and particularly after the Cold War. Uh, thanks, Bob. And first of all, thanks to uh, FPRI for putting this on. I think it's an incredibly important topic as we're about to go into the NATO summit. And then shortly thereafter, possibly a summit between our new president and President Putin. So these are, these are important times to think about these, these things. And, and let me just say uh, rather boldly up front something that I've been saying now for uh, several years, that I actually believe that NATO now is more important than it's ever been. And if we have time, I would love to talk about why I believe that. Um, 
because uh, uh, it, it is an important uh, it is an important assertion. And NATO has evolved. Um, uh, not to take you back in history, but young Captain Phil Breedlove first went to Europe in 1983. And even though I was a fighter pilot, I was serving with the U.S. Army for two years as a JTAC, as a Ford Air Controller on the ground, as an airborne battle captain in OH-58 Kiowas. And I was on the inner German border before that wall came down and staring across to the north into the Fulda Gap where 2nd Brigade 3rd ID's mission would have been to charge north into that or defend if attacked in that column. And so uh, young Phil Breedlove, Captain Breedlove started off in that height of the Cold War where that Warsaw Pact OMG operational maneuver group was seen to be as the greatest threat to Central Europe. I served through the end of the Cold War. My wife and I actually were driving to the Czechoslovak Czechoslovakian border to get some crystal because we were about to move back to America. The day that the wall came down and we saw thousands upon thousands of these little smoky cars headed west on the Audubon. We were east of Nuremberg and we had to find an American channel to find out what was going on. And when we found an English channel, it was AFN out in Nuremberg and the guy was screaming, the wall is down, the wall is down, the wall is down, the wall is down. I don't know how many times he said it, but we finally figured out that life was changing in Europe. And so as the wall came down, NATO began to change in a way that was worrisome. Uh, and that was everybody, including our country was taking huge peace dividends, drawdowns in force structure, drawdowns in basing uh, and, and force structure. It was, it was really a rush to reap that peace dividend. And uh, um, ergo, when I took over as the uh, SACUR in 13, we were facing some more drawdowns. Uh, if you remember what was going on in the summer and fall of 2013, I, I became the SACUR in the summer of 2013. Uh, President Obama was looking at a big drawdown in Afghanistan, and I thought that was going to be what dominated my time as the SACUR was what was going to be the new NATO force structure and U.S. force structure in Afghanistan. And as we changed from the combat role to the sort of nation building supportive role uh, in, in helping Afghanistan to get on its feet. And the, the way that we would draw that down was a bit worrisome because we saw that many in NATO were looking at a second round of peace dividends and drawdowns in their militaries. And frankly, I and other leaders in NATO were concerned that NATO would correct too far and that we would not then be able to meet our obligations under Article 5. And if all don't understand what Article 5 is of, of the Atlantic Treaty, that is the collective defense article, meaning if one is under attack, we are all under attack and we all come to their defense. And so uh, not to be belong the answer, but we went through a period of trying to discuss with the nations what we would do as we came out of Afghanistan and my military leaders around me at SHAPE, um, we all convinced the civilian leadership of NATO and the NAC in Brussels that we needed to have a series of exercises and self-examinations to determine, can we do our collective defense job? We've been in Afghanistan for so long doing counterinsurgency we had lost the skill sets. We had lost the command and control capabilities. We had lost the transportation capabilities and the intelligence capabilities needed to do a large force fight, which would be required by Article 5. And so we planned the Trident Juncture series of exercises. Um, and we got agreement from most of the nations in NATO that they would not further draw down their forces until we determined were we in a good position to meet our collective defense Article 5 requirements. And then frankly, it was prescient because shortly thereafter, Russia invaded and occupied Crimea. 
and then a couple of months later invaded and occupied the Donbass and, uh, and, and that sort of settled the question about whether we should be drawing down forces or not. So NATO has gone through a change from ready to fight the Warsaw Pact, Pact post 9-11, counterinsurgency for almost 20 years, ending and drawing down in Afghanistan, re-examining itself, deciding it needs to be ready for large force employment again. And then Mr. Putin invades Ukraine twice. And now we find ourselves in a very different position. Why is, you know, you, I, I want to give you time to answer this, General Breedlove. Why is NATO more important now than ever? Because I think, you know, what that assertion follows from what you just said, in a way. Yeah, so, so I take two tacks in answering this. First of all, we have an opponent that now three times since 2008 has used their military force to change internationally recognized borders in the Eurasian landmass. They invaded Georgia and still occupy South Ossetia and Abkhazia. They've invaded the Crimea and still occupy the Crimea and they invaded and now uh, set up their proxy forces in the Donbass of Ukraine. And so what we find is we have an opponent that has demonstrated, he's written about it and talked about it, but he has demonstrated three times that he will use his military once again to change internationally recognized borders in the Eurasian landmass. And so we have the same problem now that we had in the Cold War where we were facing the Warsaw Pact. On top of that now, Bob, just think about what we're, is happening to America and many other nations in this new sphere of battle, which some call hybrid war, some call gray zone war, I call war below the lines, meaning war below the lines of kinetic response. And now we face a Russia that uses all of its uh, elements of national power. I, I'm a fighter pilot, so I use a very simple model. It's called DIME, like coin, DIME. Diplomatic power, informational or disinformational power, military power, and economic power. And examine what Russia did to Ukraine. Diplomatically, a huge surge to discredit the Poroshenko government to discredit the Maidan, or as the Ukrainians call it, the revolution of, dignitary, of dignity. Information campaigns, disinformation campaigns. We could talk all day about the disinformation around the Russian shootdown of MH17. Militarily, as we said, they have invaded Ukraine and now occupy Ukraine or support occupying forces in Ukraine. And then economically, think about that winter and the next winter of 14, 13 and 14, when uh, Russia cut off heating oil, raised the prices on heating oil, recalled um, loans on energy, and used every tool in the book economically to, to put pressure on Ukraine. So here we have a country that has demonstrated it will use its military just like we were uh, concerned about in the Cold War. And now it's using all the elements, broad spectrum of tools to attack in this new hybrid war or gray zone war, whatever. So we have an opponent that has demonstrated that it will take bellicose action in much broader terms, even then during the Warsaw Pact days. And so I believe that a credible and a, a close knit alliance to defend now is more important than ever. And frankly- is Ukraine, um, uh, General, it, um, does Ukraine at the end of the day though, matter more to Russia than it does to NATO and certainly the US because of geo geographical proximity? And if it matters more to Russia, won't they be willing to take more risks than we would? Isn't okay. this a kind of imbalance? The two short answers are yes and yes. You're absolutely correct. I mean, Mr. Putin has demonstrated that he will take rural scorn. He will bear up under uh, layers and layers of sanctions. He'll do anything required to keep Ukraine from coming to the West. It does mean more to him, obviously, than it does to the West because look at how relatively 
little the West did to help Ukraine when it was invaded. I mean, we really fell short of the mark, in my opinion, of what we could have and should have done to at least uh, change the path of the future rather than what we have now, which is an occupied portion, two occupied portions of Ukraine, sort of like two occupied portions. So is NATO's strategy designed to keep Ukraine independent and neutral because it could never be a belong to NATO. The Russians wouldn't allow that. Um, you know, that would tempt war with Russia. In other words, you know, would, would NATO and Russia be satisfied with neutral status for Ukraine? And by neutral status, I, I mean it informally. I mean, it would never be declared as such, you know? Uh, you know, Ukraine would always be so-called independent. Um, but the idea of, of kind of drawing Ukraine into the West, is, is that a no-go, so to speak? Well, let's go back to what you said at the very first, and I'm not being critical because I do believe that in NATO and in U.S. European Command, there's a lot of work being done to, to advise our civilian leaders on how we could help uh, Ukraine. Um, in fact, when I was the SAC here, my predecessor, Jim Stavridis, had the foresight to start a program which we, we uh, called the military commission between Ukraine and UCOM, where we were studying how to help their military become more Western. So we've been thinking about this for a while. So this statement I'm about to say is not critical, it's just factual. You said the NATO strategy for Ukraine is, I'm not aware that we have a strategy for Ukraine. Okay, we have a lot of thinking and we have a lot of work we have done and we have offered uh, several things that we can and will do, but to say that we have a strategy to bring Ukraine into the West, I don't think that's a correct statement. So we need to start from that as a factual piece. What we do, I believe, want is a Europe whole free and at peace. And we do believe in the sovereignty of the people of Ukraine that they can self-determine where they um, attach themselves. What we don't believe in is allowing any belligerent country to hold a veto, which as you see, the veto in Georgia has been in place since 2008. And now the veto in um, Ukraine is in place since the uh, winter of 13 and, and spring of 14 and the invasion of the two portions that are currently held by Russia. When you look at Georgia and Ukraine and Crimea, what you're seeing is the greater Black Sea region, because even Georgia has a small coastline on the Black Sea. Um, given, you know, the, given that Vladimir Putin has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest you know, tragedies of the 20th century or words to that effect, um, and all these regions like Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, where Russia's also been active, they are, you know, they're all part of the former Soviet Union. So it has the Black Sea become like a real zone of contention between NATO and, the, and, and Russia? Bob, you're so prescient, and, and I thank you for this softball. You don't know, but I actually am... Um, chairing a small group that is a spinoff of MEI, Middle East Institute, and that group is called Frontier Europe, and it is completely focused on the Black Sea because the Black Sea is a, an incredibly geopolitically important place right now. First of all, the Black Sea is Russia's road to the Mediterranean and to the south. The Black Sea is an area where, just like from the Caspian Sea, they can employ long range precise strikes just like they did from the Caspian Sea into Syria. The Black Sea is incredibly important to Russia and Russia has militarized the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea to a point now where it is a very strong, what we call A2AD, anti-access area denial location, whereby they can bring precise surface to surface surface to sea and surface to air fires into much of the region of the Black Sea. And so the Black Sea is a contended area. And we have, as you know, great NATO allies in the Black Sea, Turkey, which we're having some issues with now, but a great ally in the South, 
Romania, which has become a new sort of stalwart ally of the United States and NATO in the Black Sea. And of course, Bulgaria, which struggles because it is so dependent on Russia for things like energy and other things, but yeah. it struggles to remain a strong ally, but it is under immense pressure from Russia to try to splinter them off. Yeah, I, I know that um, Bulgaria and Russia, they share a linguistic affinity, similar, whereas the Romanian language is so different. It's been hard for Russia to penetrate Romania. Romania also has oil and gas of its own, not a lot, but some. So it's less dependent on Russia than Bulgaria is. We've talked a bit about the, uh, the Black Sea. What about the Baltic Sea? Uh, you know, is, is, is that like, does that pair with the Black Sea is the two maritime zones of, of contention here that NATO's, uh, you know, involved with? Well, well uh, pardon me if I will sort of rephrase what you just said, because when I think of the Black Sea region, I'm really thinking of the Black Sea because it is a conduit for Russia. And, and it is, uh, and we have nations around it that are at threat in a big way. When you talk of the Baltic Sea, I think more of the Baltic states. And yeah. the threat to the Baltic states is more over land than from the sea. And so we think of them in a different, prop, uh, in a different uh, problem set. As you know, the two northernmost Baltic states share a long border with Russia. And just to the east of them is Piskov, which is a Russian base, which has their most, most um, offensive, most uh, rapid deploying, aeromobile offensive force in their, in their military. And they placed it literally about 40 minutes flying time from the capitals of the three Baltic nations. So in the Baltic, we think not so much of the threat from the sea, although that is a threat. Hmm. But what we think more about there is the threat across land um, and the way that Russia has positioned its forces so near that border to frankly send a message and intimidate and to prepare them well if they wanted to, to make a rapid approach to the Baltic nations. Um, to shift gears a little bit, and again, an historical question, for the last third of a century, NATO has been involved in expansion. First, it was, uh, uh, you know, the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, etc. NATO had to absorb their militaries into NATO. Um, and then there are countries which came along later, which are much weaker, like Mon Montenegro and Albania, which had to be absorbed. How has absorption gone when you, when you look back a third of a century between where we were in 1989 and where we are now? Um, you may have to remind me because I want to answer a different question first. Okay, fine. We'll get there, and then we'll talk about the absorption piece. I'm always uh, tweaked and, and jabbed with this expansion thing. And frankly, uh, we have to have intellectual honesty and understand there's two sides to every story. And Russia sees this very different than we do. They do see us expanding and they feel like they were promised we would not expand. I wanna go back to something I said about um, Ukraine. First and foremost, we believe in the sovereignty of these nations. We believe in the sovereignty of the Baltic nations who have twice won their independence from Russia. And we believe that they should have the ability to choose their own association into the futures, be it west, south, north, or east, whatever it is, it's their right to choose their associations and how they align themselves in this world. Second, um, as the uh, SACUR, um, um, I attended almost every meeting NATO had um, and all the summits and all of the ministerials from the military ministerials, defense ministerials, foreign ministerials, summits, etc. And while the actual meetings are rather scripted in things, at every one of these ministerials, there is a dinner at the end of the first night that is truly the one free-for-all of the whole meeting. And in that meeting, all of the TUS subjects are 
are talked about. And in all the other meetings, most of the delivered messages are scripted, they're approved by capitals, they're very politically aligned with nations, et cetera, et cetera. But at the dinner, things get to talk, people get to talk rather freely. And it's almost all, every meeting I was in, the open door policy was discussed. Remember when I was a SAC year, we were still at 28. They've grown now to 32 since I was. And I won't mention her name because she is still extremely prominent in world politics, but I remember a very um, uh, poignant statement by uh, one of our most illustrious female um, um, uh, politicians or political leaders one night when the, when the conversation had turned yet again against or not wanting to or slowing down expansion or whatever, and, and this individual basically, and I'm just not going to use the language because I'm protecting people and sensitivities, but it was like, well, if the blanking door is open, then somebody's got a blanking walk through it. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up because I watched for three years how hard it was for a nation to get into NATO, how many hoops they had to jump through and all the things they had to do to get into NATO. So this business where people believe that NATO is out there clawing and trying to pull people into NATO and grow towards Russia and get bigger. And, and let me tell you, it could not be more opposite of that. The nations that want in fight and fight and people fight for them to try to make it happen. So I really get sort of peaked if you can't tell here when people talk about this expansionism and the expansion of NATO. Well, if you had only knew how hard it was, you might understand this a little different. And so- How has, how has the expansion gone bureaucratically and organizationally? Are these new, you know, relatively new militaries in NATO post-1989 members? Are their military contingents in NATO of the same caliber as the West? Are they better? Are they better in some cases? Uh, you know, generally, how has the quality coefficient of NATO handled this? So this is a good news and a bad news story. Um, there are shining examples of how well nations have come forward. And, I, you know, at great risk, I would name a few things, okay? So I'm not going to name all of them, but I want to point out a few. For instance, the cyber center and the cyber capabilities of Estonia is phenomenal. And they are leading in this business. And they've written a book that is like the Bible out there in the business now that is really quite well. And so we have nations, other Baltic nations have stood up the NATO JTAC, Joint Tactical Air Controller School, and they turn out incredible people. And so each of these nations have, some, have done some things extraordinarily well. Now, there are a few of these nations that are still flying third, second and third generation Soviet aircraft and are still using uh, extremely aged Soviet ground material. And we're still fighting to get some of the nations into a place where we can truly call them as uh, interoperable with our forces on the battlefield. Um, sadly, Afghanistan has helped a great deal in that because nations that went to Afghanistan had to bring the forces they were using in Afghanistan up to standards in equipment, communications, tactics, techniques, and procedures. So, so uh, Bob, I'm, I'm skirting your question a little bit. It's a mixed bag. Some okay. of it is working really, really well, but there is still work to be done. Uh, okay, we, we're now in an age of, uh, of what has been called great power rivalry. U.S., Russia, U.S., China, with China and Russia moving closer together and what which, which which in terms of the atmospherics is a warm strategic alliance, but which may only be a tactical alliance because they have they have tensions between themselves as well. How does NATO posture for this? In other words, if the, if the, if there's a real danger in the Indo-Pacific, in Taiwan, for instance, or someplace, 
does do NATO forces help out there or quite the reverse? Do they t alleviate some of the burden off US forces in Europe? In other words, how, what's the NATO reaction as you know, evolving NATO reaction here? So, so few know, and frankly, I didn't know when an airman named Breedlove took over the NATO command, how much NATO's nations really are, were already involved in the Indo-Pacific. So one of the first weeks I was on the job, I was taking a situation overview of our uh, command and our forces and where they were deployed and so forth. And RIMPAC was going on. You're familiar with RIMPAC? Yes. Largest exercise in the Pacific. And RIMPAC was going on. And I noticed that we had nine, nine NATO nations back in 2013 sailing in RIMPAC. And I asked my commanders, I said, why in the world do we not have a NATO flagship down there and exercise that name, nine nation contingent under NATO rules and get some training out of it and show the world that NATO is here because nine, let's do it one more time, nine of 28 nations were sailing very capable craft in RIMPAC. And so um, the NATO nations, a lot of them are seafaring and commerce nations and they have long understood the requirement for the free navigation and freedom of trade and goods and passage in these waters. And so uh, it's not a new thing. Everybody's talking about, oh, it's all new now. Well, they, well they, are they worried about China? They've been worried about China for a long time. And they were demonstrating it with forces, money, and exercises. So that's just a precursor to the answer. The answer is NATO is waking up to the fact that China can affect things that NATO hold dearly. And, and oh, by the way, Bob, this whole business of the new passage along the North, the Northern Passage as the ice recedes is gonna be a big deal. China wants to be an Arctic nation because of what will happen in that water. And Russia is seeking to exert their dominance in that area. So. Uh, I'm a little off subject, but the bottom line is uh, NATO is adapting by participating. They are showing their interest by being there. And um, I, don't, I don't like the concept that people say, uh, well, you NATO, you just focus on Europe and then let us take care of uh, Asia because those nations have their own sovereign concerns about Asian waters. And how would that be for us to say, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. I mean, that, that doesn't work all that well for me. So I, I think that what we're going to see is a NATO that is focused on Russia because Mr. Putin continues to invade nations and occupy foreign lands. Um, but they are also going to be concerned about their ability to co conduct commerce freely um, in the Asian area. Well, General Breedloff, thank you so much for participating in this podcast. And, um, and you know, and we, we will conclude the podcast version of the talk now and we'll go, I'll turn it over to Raleigh Flynn for to monitor the Q&A. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, thanks for a really interesting discussion. And we have two questions uh, in the Q&A box and I'll encourage the audience to add some more. And you've already, come up very close to these two questions, but, but there are just some nuanced differences. Um, first one from Henrik Larsen. Uh, China's rise, he comments, combined with the persistent threat from Russia gives NATO increased prominence as a protector of free societies. Yet, it seems that NATO should strive for precision about where its core business of collective defense can bring added value in the pursuit of this goal. As NATO, as NATO will start drafting a new strategic concept, do you see a danger that NATO is tempted to pick up everything illiberal as a challenge it should deal with? For example, excessive condemnation of allied democratic shortcomings, committing to the Asia Pacific, and expanding resilience into law enforcement, such as against weaponized corruption. Okay, uh, wow, that is, a, uh, that is a fulsome question. So let me, let me try to pull, 
pull it apart a little bit. Um, I think that, that as I listen to the senior leaders who are preparing for the summit and have had conversations with uh, many of them, including uh, my successor, um, the, the focus of NATO in this new <coughs> revised thinking is, is going to be the same in some very important ways. And the first focus of NATO, of course, is its cohesiveness, is its unity, is its focus on those Article 5 kind of requirements. Because we face an opponent that wants to pull NATO apart. Um, you know, when Mr. Putin looks to his east, he sees China that as a big nation can deal individually with small nations and pretty much have their way with those small nations. When Mr. Putin looks to his west, he has to deal with NATO in a military sense, and he has to deal with EU in a geopolitical and economic sense, and, and that's harder. You know, and so he would much rather deal individually with small nations. And so he would like to bust apart the EU. He would like to see fissures and cracks that he can expand and live in. And the same thing in NATO. And so NATO's first focus has to be always uh, what we would call a center of gravity. And that is our unity, our cohesiveness, and our, um, our commitment to our collective defense. And so there'll be a focus on that. And what they're going to be looking at in these new uh, writings is continuing to focus on readiness and resilience and trying to determine how to deter again. We seem to understand still how to deter big things like nuclear war. But, but I would ask you, Raleigh, are we deterring these below the line actions? Are we deterring all these cyber attacks? Are we deterring all of this uh, economic uh, uh, stranglehold and energy economics that are going on? Um, my answer would be no, we're not. And so we've got to focus on a new level of deterrence that works on this active conflict, which is going on below the lines of kinetic response right now. And then there are going to be some new efforts in these new writings that really want to focus on things like uh, space and cyber. Um, I'm pretty outspoken on cyber. I've made some people mad. But right now, the way we approach cyber in the United States and the way we approach cyber in uh, NATO is we're focused on improving our defense. So I always ask people, do you think that the world's top tennis players uh, want to go into a tennis match and say, I agree to receive serve for the whole match. I'll play on the defense for the whole match. What kind of approach is that? We need to be considering about increasing the cost on these actors who are acting below the line. We need to think about picking up, if you will, a very tough term, an offense. I was happy to see that in the past week or so here, we have actually recovered money from some of the ransomware attacks in America. When we begin to increase the cost on Russia for these actions below the line, then they'll change their ways. Until we increase the cost on them, why would they change their tactics, techniques, and procedures? I wouldn't play tennis and agree to receive serve every time. Um, I would just add, that, um, you know, that the definition of war has expanded, it, you know, beyond the kinetic, you know, it's, as you said, it's, it's cyber, it's economic, and our adversaries, our rivals see war in a much more holistic sense um, than the Western way of war, which has traditionally been kinetic. Yep. Um, we have another complex question from Lee Woolley, who, who, comments that nearly one third of the world's 7.6 billion population lives under the oppression of an, authorita of an authorita authoritarian regime. 
A broad coalition, global coalition of liberal democracies is likely essential to preserve and protect the interests of the United States and its allies from the growing threats presented by these authoritarian regimes. Uh, liberal democracies outside of NATO lack coordinated military operations, intelligence sharing, economic coordination, democracy fostering programs, and institutionalized communication venues. Could we, or should we, the US, consider using the NATO framework to create this broader global alliance of liberal democracies to thwart the rise of authoritarian regimes? So let me violently agree with a few things and then maybe bring it back to a little bit more of a realistic answer. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, Lee. I think you said Lee's question and the premise of his question. It's bigger than just authoritarian. I mean, we, I, I like to really def, to sharpen the pencil when we talk about some of these regimes. I believe that Russia is a kleptocracy. It is authoritarians focused on making money. And a very few people at the top of that organization are getting very, very rich. And they are motivated by continuing to stay in power to remain rich and get richer. And so I think that we need to understand just how tough this problem is in some of these countries and what motivates those authoritarian leaders who remain in power and set themselves up to be basically president for life of these kind of organizations. And uh, it's a tough problem. And, and, and back to Bob's observation about, I call it all of government attack or all of nation attack. Um, when you're an authority, when you're in a kleptocratic or an authoritarian leader, you can make decisions and move things around quickly. Whereas in a liberal democracy, we have much more power sharing and, and work that goes on in order to respond to these kinds of attack. And so the speed and power of an authoritarian regime and the speed and power of a lie employed by an authoritarian regime is a tough thing for a liberal democracy to contend with. Second part of Lee's question, I, I, you know, this is crazy that anybody would think anything different, but as the former SACIR, I believe in alliances. I, I said already, NATO is more important now than it's ever been. And I think that like-minded nations who share Western values um, um, do need to act together. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of NATO and the EU working together. There are people out there that for some reason believe that an EU army is a threat to NATO. I have a completely different take on that. And if somebody wants to ask that question, I'd be happy to answer it. But I do believe that we need to be working um, with like-minded nations to bring pressure out there on uh, these countries. If the United States continues to just sanction, 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 additional sanctions, broader sanctions, deeper sanctions, more sanctions, additional sanctions, if that's all we ever do, we'll pretty soon find our currency doesn't, um, uh, doesn't command what it commands now in the world. And we need like-minded nations to come alongside of us and take actions broader. Remember we talked dime? When we deal with Russia, we don't do much diplomatically. We have never fought an information or disinformation command in my senior time as a leader. We don't fight Russia militarily because we fiercely fear provoking them. What do we do with Russia every time? We do E. We don't do any I, D, I, or M in a, in a grand sense. We do massive E. And we've got to figure out how to use all four of those elements of national power to respond to Russia. And we need like-minded nations in groups. So I completely agree with Lee there. Um, Lee's question, I think, is um, he is hopeful and he believes that this will work. Um, alliances are hard. Um, I likened it in NATO to a soup with 28 flavors. And making that soup sometimes was terribly hard. In the end, the soup usually tasted pretty good and we got the job done, but it was never easy. And so building these alliances and truly getting uh, 
like-minded people to commit their resources is a big deal. And so I would say to Lee, I think that it's a good thought and a good endeavor and we need to keep working on it, but I'm muted in my hopes for responses along those lines. Um, th thank you, General. Uh, Jerry Rubenstein asks an important, but a short question. And it is, has the geoeconomic rise of China adversely affected the co cohesiveness of the nation members of NATO? Um, so the answer is, is uh, sort of multifaceted. I think in the grand scheme of things, not yet. But certainly at the tactical level, it has already. I mean, look at the discussions over Huawei and other uh, Chinese technologies as they are becoming a part of things that nations want to buy, things that nations want to do, and the Belt, Belt and Road Initiative wanting to come into some of our NATO nations and take actions that change the nature and ownerships of things like ports and airfields and railroads and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I believe this is going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. I, I would uh, defer to the current leaders of NATO, but my observation so far is that this has not risen yet to a strategic disruptive place, but it certainly has begun to be a tactically disruptive issue. Thank you. Um, Raleigh, I would yeah. just add, that during the Cold War, because Russia produced nothing that anyone wanted to buy, um, the, you know, the, the, the member states of NATO did their trading with the West. They, you know, they had no choice because the Russian economy was basically closed. But nowadays, where, where China really produces many and sophisticated consumer goods that people want to buy and trade and China has money to pay for, um, it's inevitable that the NATO member states will become large trading partners of China. And that complexifies um, it, you know, it complicates, um, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, the, the alliance structure. The alliance structure was simpler in, in the Cold War because the Soviet economy for, in a sense, did not exist. Um, so an era of freer trade where, you know, what Germany is doing all it can to sell more and more goods to China has to have an effect on the alliance. It's an added challenge. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Alex Oltianu, who is from the Center for Defense and International Policy at Queen's University, Canada. Uh, he comments, NATO is in the process of rethinking its mission for 2030. Do you believe it must transform itself from a military organization with a political element into a political organization with a military wing? In other words, as an effective, legitimate, and adaptable NATO, not a military organization, sort of a in search of an enemy, but a new structure of transatlantic governance where the military aspect constitutes only one, albeit critically important aspect of its raison d'etre. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, Alex, it's a great question. Um, I may disappoint you. I'm gonna answer with purely my opinion, not the opinion of the US government or any organization I work for or work in or have represented in the past, I'm going to give you Phil Breedlove, former SACUR's uh, answer. And I don't think it's the one you want. I honestly believe we have a political organization that, uh, that works for all the things that you're talking about, and that is the European Union. And I believe that we have another organization that is unique in that it is more military oriented but let me tell you for sure, it is a military organization that is commanded by the political element. And that is NATO. And frankly, in my opinion, I don't see a need in changing those two organizations. I'm a big believer that the EU and NATO can work well together and that they keep their relative um, um, their relative strengths and their relative capabilities the same, 
And then when used together, they're quite um, um, demonstrative. Let me use two examples, one which is well known and one which is not well known. If you remember the piracy problem around the Horn of Africa, um, uh, out around uh, um, um, the seas there where the pirates were uh, causing so much havoc, taking so much money, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, uh, NATO sailed uh, a command and control capability and ships in there and started making a little impact on what the pirates were doing. And what they did then was they went ashore and they basically said, we're just gonna wait NATO out. They're not gonna be here you know, for the next 30 years. We'll just wait them out. So what happened then? The EU joined the fray and NATO and the EU came together and the EU had all those other tools that NATO doesn't have. It could reach a floor ashore into policing, into governmental structures, into the, um, the military capabilities ashore as well as afloat. And now you had a team that denied the pirates a safe haven anywhere because the EU and their forces and the people they were working with ashore uh, coupled with NATO's military capability and command and control of float, now we had a force that made a difference. Now let's give credit also, the steaming lines and the ship lines changed some of their tactics. But between all of this, we made a huge dent and that's because the, the special capabilities of NATO were wed to the special capabilities of the EU and those two things became a, an effective force. Very few know that in Bosnia Herzegovina right now, uh, well, let me correct myself. When I left as SACUR, I believe it's still to be now, but I haven't checked it today. But in Bosnia Herzegovina, you have a EU military force commanded by a NATO commander, the deputy SACUR. And why did that work? Because the EU actually has some military capability, but what they don't have is all the intelligence communications, command and control, transport, logistics that NATO has. And so a combination of a NATO commander and supporting structure with EU military forces who are thin on those enablers and those enabling capabilities, we put those two together and we have a force that works well. And so I just, uh, uh, I've gotten off the subject a little bit, Alex, and I'm sorry about that. But I believe we have a great arrangement now. We have a force, the EU, that can work these more political uh, governance things that you talk about. And we have another force whose competency is military action and defense. And the two of them work extremely well together when we set about doing that. And I personally, Alex, would not change that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ira Strauss, who is the sponsor of our Robert Strauss Who Pay project. Uh, Ira asks, is NATO due for an institutional upgrade in the face of new challenges and tasks? The last upgrade was a generation ago with the NACC, EAPC, P4P, CJTFs, some committee reforms. Is, is an East Asia Partnership Council possible or or more reforms on committees and decision making. Okay, now I risk making my current uh, friends in NATO angry. Um, uh, sir, Ira, I would first of all, thank you for supporting this series. Um, and it's a pleasure to answer your question. And my question is gonna be a tiny bit caustic. Um, what I would, and I and actually believe some of the senior military leaders of NATO feel much the same. Um, if I was uh, still in the seat, I would not be focused on more institutional change. I would be focused first and foremost on readiness and capability and uh, commitment. So our forces are still not as ready as they need to be. We need to, we have a lot of investment yet in things like exercises, hit in order to get our forces more uh, available when needed and better trained when needed. Remember, we went through almost 20 years of counterinsurgency. 
and the skill sets for counterinsurgency are very different than the skill sets for collective defense. And so we need to be working on our readiness. We need to be working on our capabilities. Remember the question that Bob asked me about what these new nations are bringing to the skill sets of NATO. And we have nations that are still flying second and third generation Soviet equipment, sailing second and third generation Soviet equipment, using ground capabilities that are very old and left over from the Soviet days. We need NATO to find its way forward to a, a completely interoperable force. In fact, I heard a new word, which really excites me. They're actually using interchangeability, which I think is interoperability on steroids. It just takes the bar to a new level that really would change the battlefield if our forces were more interchangeable. And then the last one, of course, is commitment. Um, military forces cost money. Training them costs money. And then giving up them to do other missions is sometimes hard for a small country when it's thinking of its own defense, but it's being asked to commit forces to a larger NATO uh, goal. Um, uh, and that, so I think that first and foremost, before I would think about new structures, if I was uh, sitting in the chair again, and I actually believe those sitting in the chair now are focused first and foremost on readiness, capabilities, and commitment. Thank you. Um, we're rapidly coming out of time. So I'm gonna run down to Walter McDougall, our, um, our, our distinguished chair of our advisory council, uh, has asked a question about Turkey and there are several questions about Turkey. Walter's is, I'll see if I can combine them. What, likely, what is the likelihood that NATO and Turkey will park, part ways in the near, ter, near future given that the Soviet threat was the principal glue holding them together? Um, Ryan Doherty also asks, how can US officials encourage more constructive Turkish behavior, especially in areas like the Eastern Mediterranean and Libya, and regarding the deployment of the S-400, all of which undermine NATO unity and support for Turkey and institutions such as Congress. And finally, we have an anonymous attendee who asked, does Turkey's involvement in NATO create a fundamental structural issue for the alliance? Currently, multiple EU, EU countries are undergoing a regional conflict with Turkey over resource rights and illegal armament in Libya. Will this slowly degrade the value of the alliance if there is an independent geopolitical entity working within it? Okay, that's a broad range of questions, and I think we only have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to yeah. do this at the wave top level. First of all, I make no apologies. I am unabashedly uh, pro keeping Turkey in our alliance and working hard to do it. Turkey is incredibly important geopolitically. And just, just like um, realtors in America talk about all the time, location, location, location. This country sits on some of the most important land and water in our defense alliance. And we need to work with them. Second thing I would say, and I say this, it sounds joking, it really isn't. This is not as bad as it's been in the past. NATO has its ups and downs. Remember that NATO was thrown out of a NATO country once, thrown out, expelled. We moved our headquarters to Mons and to Brussels from Paris. Um, and so we're not nearly as in bad a place as we have been in our past. And so we need to, rather than focus on the negative, I think we need to focus on how we get over this. And we have survived challenges in leaderships. I would offer to you that there's a lot of countries in Turkey you might look at, or in NATO that might be looking at us and saying, whoa, we just survived a challenge in leadership. And we have survived other nations in NATO having some challenging leaderships. And Mr. Erdogan is definitely headed in a direction that is challenging for many of our NATO allies and partners. But I, I just want to close with saying, let's, I, uh, as an airman, I could talk all day about why we can't work with the S-400 and why we can't have F-35 in Turkey. 
uh, until the S-400 is gone. I, I, you got to understand that I'm a hardliner on some of these things. But when it comes to Turkey overall, this is a place where we need to dig in and move out. We don't, we don't write this off. We've got to work forward with diplomacy and get in there and figure out a way ahead. This, in, this country is too important to our alliance to write off. I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question, but you certainly got my opinion. Thank you, General. Um, I think we're, we are out of time. Um, Bob and General Breedlove, would you like to make some final comments? Bob, a few. I'll first. just make, um, why don't I make a final comment real quick and then General Breedlove can have a fine, you know, can, can close it out. Remember, one of the reasons why Turkey is behaving as it is is because the region around Turkey changed so much. Syria's collapsed, Iraq's collapsed, Cur Turkey has a Kurdish problem along its border, which it did not have when Syria and Iraq were, were you know, you know, were well-functioning states, albeit authoritarian. Um, and even with all of Putin's aggression, Russia is less capable in the former Soviet Union than the Soviet Union itself was in the Caucasus and all over. So Turkey faces less pressure from the North and therefore may need less from the United States. So it's not just Turkey that's changed under the current leadership. It's the region of the greater Middle East that has changed. And that's why I would agree with General Breedloff that we have to work hard to keep Turkey in. So my, my closing comment will not be focused only on Turkey. I, I just hope you, that you have picked up, even though I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes, that I am well over a glass half full when it comes to NATO. This is an important alliance and it's an important thing that, that we need to do into the future. And, and, and may I just say that, and this sounds pejorative and I'm sorry, but there are more than one example, and we could talk about them, where in history, militaries have stayed close to each other while political figures butted heads. And that political glue solved the problem in the end game about nations staying together and working together because of the glue that the fabric of sometimes diplomacy and military would overcome the political problems at the top. And I believe that because as, a, as the military commander of, of NATO and uh, uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, um, I saw that every day. We would have nations that would be having problems in the press and problems publicly. And our soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines at NATO were working together diligently every day to get through those things and get the job accomplished. And so, I see a great value to this alliance. I see a great value to NATO remaining focused on its military competency, but under a strong rubric and umbrella of civilian control. And in that uh, setup, I really believe NATO is something that's going to serve us well for another 70 years. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you, General, and thank you, Bob, for, for a really fascinating and important discussion. And thanks to, to our audience today for staying tuned with apologies to those whose questions I just could not get to. Um, please stay safe and take care. Thank you again. Bye, all. Bye.